Okay, great. Well, it's so fabulous to be here. Um, I, I, I really love how you sort of set our frame of mind. Um, in Buddhism, they call it beginner's mind. Some of you that are out there, kind of Buddhist like me, uh, trying to be Buddhist, or possibly trying to just learn as much as humanly possible. Uh, I'm an academic, uh, and I'm here to kind of tell you a little bit about my research with the hope that we can kind of um, really respond to your, your plea for us to have more bridging across academia and, and, um, and really what you do, which is more important than the stuff that I do. So I'm gonna tell you about my work on culture, um, and I will just kind of give you a high level overview of the work and sort of end with um, some uh, really thoughts about what my, we can learn together on this topic. So let me start with um, one of my favorite stories. Uh, these two fish are swimming along, uh, and they pass another fish. And he says, hey, boys, how's the water? And they swim on. And one looks at the other and says, what the heck is water? And you might have heard this very simple story that makes a really pretty profound point, which is that sometimes the realities around us that are so obvious, they're most difficult to see. We take them for granted. And for fish, that's water. But for humans, that's culture. And culture is this really weird puzzle. It's omnipresent, it's all around us 24 seven, but we really don't think about it. We think about it really when we get outside of our cultural bubble and we realize, holy moly, like we've been socialized to have our own culture that's driving our behavior all the time, but we don't really think about it, we don't really understand it. And what's so fascinating from my point of view is that as humans, we have so many technical feats and accomplishments. We've put a human on the moon, we've wired the earth, We've discovered the laws of physics. You know, we've done a lot of good stuff, but what if we could understand some of the underlying laws of culture, sort of secret codes driving our behavior? So that's the kind of stuff that I've been really interested in for like 30 years now. I just dye my hair so you can't tell. Uh, I do want to say I wasn't always interested in culture. Uh, I am a native New Yorker. I don't know if you could tell by my accent. Even though I'm a transplant to California, I'm always a New Yorker. Um, and I had this kind of typical New Yorker view of the world. You guys might have seen this New Yorker cartoon. Everything that we need to learn about is through the New Yorker magazine. Uh, and I had this kind of typical view. You know, there's New York City. We do acknowledge New Jersey. I think that's a major point in this cartoon. That's a, uh, but then there's the rest of the world. There's rocks in the Pacific Ocean. And, and I was a junior uh, at Colgate University, um, and I went abroad to uh, the UK. And I was kind of a sheltered kid from Long Island, Long Island as we call it. Uh, and I was, was in a tremendous state of culture shock. I, I just really couldn't understand, even though we spoke English, the, you know, the culture in the UK. And I remember calling my dad, Marty from Brooklyn, uh, and confiding him how just freaked out I was basically. And, and among other things, why were people going from like London to Paris or to Amsterdam just for the weekend? And my dad said something very important on this call. It really changed my life. He said, imagine like it's going from New York to Pennsylvania. And I was like, oh, Pop, that is such a great metaphor. And I had a lot of time on my hands, so this is a true story. The next day, I, I booked a low-budget trip to Egypt. <laughs> and my dad is like, what are you doing? I'm like, Pop, it's like going from New York to California. Don't worry about it. And, and I really started on that trip, this like two-week Faluka boat, low-budget tour. I was the only American, and I just really discovered this, whoa, I really know nothing about culture. Um, and how is that the case? Um, if it's the case, then I really know very little about myself. And I then set on a journey, I went back to Colgate, I was pre-med, and I just kind of pivoted. I discovered the field of cross-cultural psychology, which is a field that studies uh, human behavior around the world. Uh, and I wound up going to Champaign-Urbana to study with one of the founders of my field, um, and Harry had some great advice. I think it uh, kind of echoes what you have said earlier. Um, he said, you know, first of all, be passionate about, about what you do. For many of us, that's not so difficult. Uh, his second point was, don't be afraid to be controversial. Maybe a little more difficult. And the third thing that's the most difficult, he said, is don't take yourself too seriously. <laughs> so I always tried to really kind of model that to my kids, my students. But in any event, since I was in Champaign-Urbana in the early 90s, I've been running around the world trying to understand you know, how do cultures vary, why do they vary, and with what consequence. And I take a very broad view of culture that spans from nations to our households. Um, and I started getting interested in this topic because I was traveling around the world noticing just really big differences in how cultures organize themselves. For example, um, how many of you have been to Singapore? 
Um, you know it's called the fine country because there's a lot of rules they have to abide by. You're not allowed to bring a lot of gum into the country. Americans think that's really weird. Come back to that a little bit later. Um, you can get fined for lots of things like picking flowers or uh, not flushing the toilet in public toilets. Or even if you walk naked in front of your curtains at night with them open, you can land a fine in Singapore. I'm just warning you just in case you, you guys are <laughs> considering that. If you take a short plane ride over to New Zealand, you'll see other types of behaviors. You see people walking barefoot in banks. You might see on college campuses people lighting up <laughs> fires. Um, New Zealand is also the only culture that I've encountered that has its own, or had its own, national wizard. So this dude here on the left is the national wizard of New Zealand. He was um, a fired professor from Australia who landed in the streets of New Zealand, and he was lecturing on everything from rugby to religion, and um, all sorts of other shenanigans. And the prime minister of New Zealand asked him to become the wizard. He gave him a little driver's license. I have a picture of it. It's not fake news. And he said, look, your job is to entertain the country. And that's what he did. He would hatch himself out of eggs on top of libraries and other things like that. Anyway, if you go around the world, you see other contrasts. Like in Germany, for example, in general, people tend to wait patiently on street corners even when there's no cars in tow, cars around. In New York City, my beloved New York, you see people jaywalking all the time, even with kids in their arms. This is a very interesting device here that I discovered that is being piloted in some German cities. It's called Street Pong. And it, this dude is actually playing a game of ping pong, electric ping pong, with a person across the street. I've seen a technology, and it's really an incentive to kind of stay put. They tell you when the light's about to turn. So you can see there's kind of extra incentive to kind of uh, you know, follow the rules. Um, on a more serious note, you know, you know that in some contexts, like in the Netherlands, you can openly um, smoke weed. Uh, in other contexts, this same behavior can get you the death penalty. You know, so there's lots of variation around the world in terms of constraint and latitude, or really um, how strictly people adhere to social norms. And these are kind of the, really the most interesting concept to me, because we follow social norms all the time. All human societies have norms. Sometimes these unwritten rules behave become more instantiated in laws and codes. And they're so important. They're, they really are just an incredible human invention because they help us to coordinate and predict each other's behavior on an unprecedented basis. And you can kind of think about, like, what if we never invented social norms? What would life be like on this planet? And it's really disturbing. I mean, imagine people just driving on any side of the street they want to drive on, or they're stealing food off of people's plates in restaurants and belching really loudly. That sounds like my New York family, by the way. Uh, or they're you know, taking their clothes off and starting to get frisky with each other in banks, you know, or on sidewalks or in airports. I saw a little bit of that yesterday in Newark, by the way. But there's a reason why we don't do these things. You know, we are a normative species. We get normative radar very early in our lives. And, and although other species have some kind of ingredients of this normative psychology, they don't nearly have the scale of which they develop and enforce social norms, and it's the glue, really, that keeps us together. But what I've been studying over the last know, 10, 15 years, more even, um, is how that glue is stronger in certain contexts than others. And this is what we call tight and loose cultures. This is the su subject of my book, Rule Makers, Rule Breakers. Um, tight cultures have strict norms and punishments for deviance. Uh, they restrict the range of behavior that's seen as permissible. Whereas loose cultures have a much wider range of behavior that's permissible, um, and they have weaker norms. And there's nothing inherently better or worse about tight or loose, um, but they each confer certain strengths and liabilities to human groups. And I mean that from the nation level all the way to organizations, to our households, and our mindsets. So I'm going to take you on this kind of journey and talk about tight, loose, and really it's logic. Why does it evolve in the first place? Maybe there's some good reasons why some groups evolved to be tight or loose. And what are those multi-level consequences with the strengths and, and, and liabilities? But maybe even more importantly is how do we negotiate this? Like if we can make this visible, we have a new flashlight to view the world and ourselves, then we can harness the power of social norms to change them as needed. And that might be um, in organizations that might be veering too tight or too loose. I'm going to talk a little bit about that toward the end of the talk. It might be in our households. I, for one, am constantly negotiating with my kids on tight and loose and spouse. I'm going to say, truth be told, I, I lean moderately loose, and he leans moderately tight. He's a lawyer. So he, we have different sort of pressures on our 
psychologies. And I'm going to later on show you a place to see my tight loose mindset quiz so you can take it and see where you fall on this distinction. But the point here is that we can actually negotiate um, this construct in our everyday lives. And maybe on a more serious note, I'll end the talk talking about the implication of tight loose for COVID-19 um, and some of the research we've done on that uh, and maybe what we can learn from that when we invariably have to deal with future threats. So um, that's the kind of agenda. I want it on the record that I started late. You know, I just want <laughs> to negotiate. You know, I just want to get that time back. All right, so I'm going to just give you a very high-level overview of this. This is uh, meant to just give you a gist of what's going on with this construct uh, and how we look at it. First time we started looking at this was just to try to see, can we measure this? This is what we try to do in you know, the scientific community, is to sort of prove this construct exists and is different from other constructs and, and so forth. And so we did a study, it was published in Science um, about 10 years ago now, where we looked to see, well, can we measure this construct and, and what, are, what does it relate to? Um, these nations were chosen later, you'll see why. Um, and we had a lot of people, but you know, this is not a huge sample size, I just want to point that out. We had to stop collecting data at some point and, and analyze the data. And as we were collecting survey data, we we're also measuring aspects of these nations, ecologies, and their histories. We were doing all sorts of weird field experiments. We we're sending my students around the world to do strange things in city streets. We'll have to talk about that. Uh, because we wanted to get as much knowledge as possible about this construct. And we did sh show in this study that you could classify nations uh, as whether they veered tight or loose, even though all nations have tight and loose elements. Um, places like Japan and Singapore, Austria, tended to veer tighter in our data, just by example. Uh, cultures um, like the US, uh, New Zealand, Brazil, Greece, and the Netherlands tended to veer looser and there was all range of variation. It was a dimension, like you can think about a metric on which you can place nations. And what we discovered was really kind of an interesting trade-off from a lot of data I'm summarizing, what I call the order versus openness trade-off. Tight cultures have a lot of order in our data. They have less crime, they have more police per capita, more people, more security cameras, if we counted them in city streets per capita. They also have more uniformity uh, and synchrony so when we measure how, what people wear, or the cars they drive, they're more uniform in tighter cultures. Actually, in one study, we also looked to see how synchronized are city clocks in streets. <laughs> so you've probably been in a situation in some places, like in Italy, I'm, I'm like, you're not really sure what the time is, or well, agrees. So the clocks really don't align. I and mean, so we measured how aligned are the city clocks in these streets, and sure enough, it was correlated with our data. Like tight cultures have much more synchrony in their city clocks. Um, other data show there's more synchrony in stock markets also in tight cultures, people buying and selling stocks more tightly coupled in these contexts. Um, and also, we found in general, tight cultures have more self-control. If you're in a context where there's a lot of monitoring and potential punishments, then you learn from an early age to manage your impulses. Um, and that applies to a lot of other macro data like lower debt, lower obesity, lower alcoholism, all sorts of self-regulation types of um, things that we're concerned about. Uh, in, in writing the book, I also discovered that even pets in tight cultures tend to be skinnier. I have a beloved Portuguese war dog. She's obese, I mean, gigantic. Um, and you know, I didn't realize maybe, you know, I, I want to do a study of culture and dog to some point. Maybe you'll invite me back when I have that kind of data. In any event, um, tight cultures corner the market on order. Uh, loose cultures struggle with order in general. They have um, more self-regulation failures. But, on the flip side, what we found is loose cultures have much more openness. They have more tolerance from different people, races, religions, creeds, immigrants. Obviously, there's no perfect culture out there. They still struggle. But in our data, uh, we could see that there's much more tolerance of different types of people. Uh, in one study that showed this kind of in the wild, I had my students go around the world back to their home countries and they were wearing, in one condition, these really weird facial warts. I bought them on the internet and I kind of planted on their faces. In another condition, they were wearing like tattoos and nose rings and so forth. And, and in a third condition, they were just wearing their face. They were wearing their face. They were without these adornments, we'll call them. And we had them like asking for help in city streets and in, in stores. And they were trained in Bremen, where I had this Humboldt Award, to be standardized and then go back to their countries to do this. And what was really fascinating about this data is that when people were wearing the normal face, there was no difference across cultures in how much help they got. But when they were wearing those warts or those nose rings and other kind of stigmas, uh, they got far more help in looser cultures um, as compared to the tight cultures. 
So we could see this both with surveys and also we could see it happening in city streets. Uh, in lots of our data, um, loose cultures are more creative. Um, there's large scale crowdsourcing studies of creativity. People from loose cultures are more likely to enter them and they're more likely to win them. This is a different question though about implementation. If we think about innovation, you know, you could be super creative, but if you don't have some kind of standardization and synchrony, you can't implement. So I'm gonna come back to that issue of like, how do we think about innovation from a tight loose perspective? It's not that loose cultures are more innovative, they're more creative, and I, I think that's an important distinction. Um, and it, create, it sort of uh, raises the question of how do you balance those together, which I'll get to later. Anyway, uh, also loose cultures tend to be more open to change. So when we do work with um, computer scientists, we create these fake models of societies um, that um, we could see if we enter a new norm into these societies, they take off much more quickly in looser cultures where there's less kind of coordination on norms. So that's kind of the trade-off that we've seen in a lot of data. And you'll see this at different levels of analysis, states, organizations, and individual mindsets. Um, I like to think about it as, are you a chaos Muppet or an order Muppet? So we're gonna come back to this, but you can sort of have this question in your mind. Are you like Bert and Kermit the Frog? Uh, or are you more like Cookie Monster and Ernie? Okay, so we're gonna come back to that. We each have our own default on this continuum also from our own personal histories. And it reflects a similar type of psychology across levels. But anyway, one question that we had was, well, what predicts this? What, what, why does this evolve in the first place? And what we found that was interesting is there's no difference in tight and loose cultures in terms of wealth. You can have rich, tight, and rich, loose cultures, and likewise, for poor countries, there was no common language or religious tradition. And these are places that are all over the place, no common geographical location. So one of the things that we, uh, we were, I was betting NSF's money on was that there might be a, a rationale for tight and loose, uh, at least one predictor, was um, what we thought would be a history of collective threat. And the idea is actually pretty simple, that cultures that have a lot of continuous warfare, chronic natural disasters, mother nature's fury, and other types of um, collective threats require more coordination and they need stricter rules to help them coordinate to survive. Uh, that's what the function of norms are. They have that coordination predictability. So we were out, as we were collecting that data, collecting data on the last 100 years, like how many times has your nation been potentially invaded? Uh, I remember my daughter when she was five, she's like, are we worried about Mexico and Canada invading us? And I, it's the kind of stuff you write down, right? You know, like, why would you ask that question? Of course not. Like, we're separated by two oceans this country. Of course, we've had our share of threat, 9-11 and so forth. But we haven't had chronic threat to our territory, whereas other countries in our data did. Uh, we also measured things like population density as far back as, like, 1,500. If you live in Singapore, where there's, like, 20,000 people per square mile, it's so a lot of potential chaos compared to New Zealand where there's like 60 people per square mile. We measured uh, natural disasters and other types of threats. So anyway, this is a proof of concept. You just see this kind of data. This is kind of correlational data. Later, we sort of test more causal theories on this. But the point was that you know, we could see some evidence. Not all tight cultures are threatened and not all loose cultures are on easy street. But we, we could see a connection of tightness and threat. Uh, I like to sort of show this quote by Lee Kuan Yew uh, who really was a cross-cultural psychologist as far as I'm concerned. You know, he, in his autobiography, he talks about this, you know, that Singapore was really threatened, and, and he basically deduced that you know, we, we need to have some rules here. We need to have some um, more rugged, better organized, more efficient than others in the region. Um, so this, you, know, you could see this kind of echoing in kind of top-down leadership. Just um, back to the gum example in Singapore, you know, in the late 80s, you know, people were chewing gum and throwing it on the floor in Singapore. It's a really highly densely populated place. And it was causing a lot of problems. It was like stopping up subways and elevators. And Lee Kuan Yew said, you know what, guys? Like, we're going to have to just ban this tasty treat. Like, sorry. But like, this doesn't really work in this kind of place. And you know, Americans, when I first learned about this, I thought this was preposterous. But if you were born and raised in Singapore, you might actually be willing to sacrifice you know, this freedom uh, for more coordination and order. Okay, I just want to mention uh, before I, I'm going to get to this kind of fractal pattern. This comes from physics, this repeated pattern across levels, where we see the same kind of general principle and logic of tight loose. Um, we recently partnered with anthropologists, which is a very difficult collaboration, as it turns out, um, because um, as a psychologist, like we like to measure stuff and we like to compare places, and there's not a lot of anthropologists who are in that tradition. Um, so we partnered, though, with uh, Carol Ember, who's at Yale. We, we coded these very large 
uh, long-winded ethnographies that came from all over the world. Um, these are non-industrial societies. You see, we see the same kind of pattern. And we coded tight loose in different domains in law and ethics and socialization, gender, and so forth. And we could see they comprised kind of an underlying factor. So in any event, this is kind of where we were collecting a lot of this data. And we saw very similar patterns in this data on um, that threat seemed to be correlated with our independent ratings of these ethnographies. OK, um, I was given some kind of signal, but I'm just going to ignore it for now. So that's, uh, <laughs> that's, I have 26 minutes right now, but I'm going to keep going. I, I'm just going to give you a flavor of what this looks like at the state level. More recently, we just, uh, co we just measured this at the US 50 state level. Uh, we could see that we have a similar pattern of scarcity and disasters, pathogens, and also a percentage of rural, which is an indication of how easy it is to monitor and uh, sort of have a gossip mill to help reinforce norms. And we saw the same order openness trade-off at the state level also. Um, and I think, you know, I could tell you later on where your state falls um, on tight loose if you're interested. But we, we saw, for example, with the study, that tight states had people in them that had more conscientiousness, they had more social organization in terms of law enforcement, less homelessness, less divorce, uh, and they had higher self-control, um, controlling for other factors, like less debt and less recreational drug use. But again, on the looseness side, they, these states are much more open. They have higher openness in terms of personality, more creativity, and less discrimination. I also discovered, as read in the book, that tight states are more polite, New York, my beloved New York, is rated as number one on rudeness. Uh, and this might be why I got into trouble in the South, where I, New Yorkers like to flip people off. You know? So we, it's like an affectionate thing, but it's not well received in some states. Uh, loose states are more fun. So that's the trade-off with some of that state data, politeness or fun. Um, we've been also looking at this construct over time. So we develop dictionaries um, with um, linguistic, um, computational linguistic techniques we can look to see over the last 200 years, has the US been changing in terms of tight loose? And sure enough, we could see there's been gradual loosening over the last 200 years um, and uh, decreasing tightness, so increasing looseness. And this has been correlated with, in, in this research with shifts in order and openness. So for example, we found in this data that periods of looseness are associated with more creativity, but, um, but less order, more debt. So that's the kind of same thing, trade off you see it over time. OK, last level of analysis before I get to the question of which is better. I'm going to have you vote. Um, I just want you to think about, if I say follow the rules, you know, kind of what comes up in your mind. You, know, you can think about, you know, if someone said, write down a couple of things of what, what comes to mind when you hear this prompt, you know, what would you say? This is what we use when we're studying social class. So this is the last level analysis I want to mention, is that we can think about social classes differing more in just their bank accounts, but differing on tight loose as well. And we've given this prompt to people from the working class, uh, as well as people from the upper class. We get very different responses. And our theory is basically based on tight loose, which is that the working class is worried about falling into hard living, or what sociologists call hard living, which is basically dregs of poverty, uh, more likely to be in occupations that are more dangerous, um, and also just being in context where rules really can help keep kids out of trouble. So when we ask people from the working class, what do you think about rules, we find that they're more positively balanced from people come from the working class, whereas they're more of a nuisance and kind of goody two-shoes when they're coming from the upper class. And in fact, if you go to any American bookstore, you can see lots of books that talk about break the rules. Um, uh, and that's true to some extent, but it just doesn't apply in context where there's a lot of threat. Um, I found one book that I keep on my shelf. It's for children. It's on how to promote anarchy <laughs> from the point of view. Um, and this trade-off is found also, the order openness trade-off. When we bring people in the lab, we could see that there's more creativity among the upper class, but there's more rule abidance among uh, the working class. I'll just mention that in more recent studies, I'm going to just show you this picture. Um, we've been bringing three-year-olds into our laboratory. Um, this is with my former student, Jesse Harrington. And this is a really interesting paradigm, because you can't exactly ask three-year-olds what they think about rules. But you can have them playing with this puppet. This is Max the puppet. Uh, and they befriend the puppet, and they um, start playing new games that they've never played with. This is called daxing. And they learn the rules, and they're playing, have a nice time. And then all of a sudden, Max, the puppet, becomes a norm violator in the middle of the experiment. So it's like violating the rules, and it's announcing that he's playing the, rule, the game correctly. And we simply videotape the kids to see, like, what do they do? And we can see that there's much more protesting of, of the puppet among the working class than the upper class, who kind of let him off the hook. 
In any event, this is to suggest that this stuff starts early. Um, we also see this with parents and their implicit theories about rules. Okay, so I want to ask you which is better, tight or loose? So let me just have you kind of vote. If you had to design a world, would you, and you had to choose, what would you, what would you do? I'm going to have you guys just vote by raise of hands. How many would you choose tightness? And how many would you choose looseness? And how many of you would not answer the question? <laughs> and this is about right what we get. Um, and you know, this has been an age-old debate from economists, political philosophers, psychologists, sociologists. Should we have freedom or constraint? You had people like Plato, Confucius, Hobbes, who had a very negative view of the world, who thought that constraint is really important, rules are important. Then you had people like John Stuart Mill, Freud, thought rules make us neurotic. And so the question is, what's the answer? And in our work, this is where we get now more toward balance. We said, well, maybe it's neither. Maybe it's the extremes of this construct that are really problematic, and this is what we have to watch out for in our organizations, in our households, in our nations. Uh, and too tight of cultures are very repressive, uh, and people are, of course, feel that this is untenable. But also, cultures that are really getting too loose are very chaotic, and they don't have this function of norms in terms of their coordination power, and they're also untenable. And so we call this the Goldilocks principle of tight news. I'm going to just now kind of zoom into like this kind of framework and what it can offer us in terms of actively harnessing the power of norms to create balance. Now I want to mention, of course, groups have to be tight or loose for good reasons, but the extremes uh, are really problematic. And you could just see, this is data that we pr uh, published a couple years ago, we call this a curvilinear relationship. The extremes of tight and loose is at the national level are producing more depression, more suicide, higher blood pressure, lower happiness. Also innovation, some data we just published this year um, that they really both are problematic. But this principle is not just found at the national level. It's really, quite frankly, in many contexts. Like in leadership, a lot of the research in organizational behavior suggests that leaders that are too laissez-faire or too directive, these are the extremes of tight and loose, produce followers who are really unhappy and not very well motivated. Um, back to Sheena's work, same principle, too much choice and too little choice is problematic for human psychology. So it's really about that sweet spot of how do you balance having you know, some choice but not an enormous amount of choice. Uh, I mentioned innovation. You know, on the one hand, looseness is great for creativity, but without having some tightness, we can't really stand, coordinate. But even with tightness, we can implement, if we don't have the looseness, we can't come up with the ideas in the first place. So there's a really Nice curvilinear relationship there. Even parenting, a lot of research on parenting suggests that parents that are too helicopter-like, but also too laissez-faire, on the flip side, produce really maladaptive kids. In fact, right now we're studying kids who come to college coming from very tight households, and guess what? They kind of go off the deep end, right? Uh, we're also doing work in military context. You're in really tight context, and then you release from that, what's gonna happen? <laughs> you know, we could see some kind of loss of self-control, and likewise, it's really difficult when you come from very uh, loose context also. So this all speaks to the idea that we need to have some balance. We need to identify context where we need to tighten loose norms uh, or identify context where we need to loosen tight norms. It's what I call tight loose ambidexterity, uh, drawn from my colleagues um, Michael Tushman and Charles O'Reilly. Uh, and I just want to end with talking a little bit about organizations and then maybe I can get quickly to COVID. Because this same construct of tight loose applies to organizations, and I'm really curious to hear from you guys um, during the break, kind of where, where do you think your organizations fall on this? I mean, obviously there's variation within organizations by function also, but the general rule of thumb is that, actually I'm just gonna cut to the chase here so that I can get to, um, you can classify the people, practices, and leadership of organizations along tight loose lines. Uh, people in tight cultures tend to have a lot of conscientiousness and they're more careful, more prevention focused. They have a lot of standardization, onboarding, to help people have shared mental models. That helps to coordinate and be more standardized. And they have leaders who are more autonomous and confident. Uh, we've measured leadership in tight and loose cultures. We see they're really different, where they're more empowering in loose organization cultures, where there's more discretion, more flexibility, where there's more informality, um, and where people who are attracted to those organizations have more personality openness. So there's really, um, really big differences in the people, practices, and leaders of tight loose organizations. Uh, when we've studied mergers and acquisitions across cultures in a recent HBR paper that I can, it's on my website or I can send it to you, we found that when there's big differences um, in tight loose across nations, that it costs 
um, companies millions of dollars uh, in terms of um, ROA. Uh, and of course, these are invisible kinds of attributes. So a lot of times we think about technically, is this, uh, the company we're acquiring going to help us strategically? But we don't often think about the underlying cultural iceberg. Um, and if we do, we might be able to negotiate it ahead of time. In the book, I talk a lot about different examples of this. But let me just um, end on, uh, on the organizational front and then promise I'm almost done. Uh, they'll just quickly get to COVID. But I do want to say that you know, we can start thinking about, in an organizational context, when we're getting too extreme. You know, overly tight cultures have this helicopter-like uh, attributes. They're ultra-standardized, lots of rules. People kind of walking on eggshells. Overly loose on the flip side are more chaotic. They lack oversight. They're unpredictable, and so forth. Um, and we've seen this with employee observations, like people, their language, when you talk to them about what they perceive, it falls along similar lines. Uh, you could just see some of this. This comes from Glassdoor, by the way. Um, we've been partnering with them to look at tight loose uh, with their data. Anyway, so the point here is that we can negotiate this. We can pivot as needed, and I call this flexible tightness when we're trying to loosen up tight cultures. They need to be tight, like for example, airlines or the military. I work with the Navy a lot now. We're not going to try to make them loose organizations. That would be kind of ridiculous. You know, on airlines, we don't want them like becoming super loose, but they might need to insert some discretion into that system. This happened after the United fiasco. You know, maybe we don't need to follow the rules all the time. We can find contexts that are not safety related where we can give people a lot of autonomy and discretion. Or we can think about tightening up loose cultures. There's a lot of places in the Silicon Valley we might nominate that need that, <laughs> um, that will remain nameless. But we call this structured looseness. Okay, these places, we want them to be loose, but maybe they need to have some pockets of tightness. So that, that of course, you know, there's questions of how to do that. I'll, I'm gonna mention two things that we've been thinking about about this. Uh, we call this the ease model, when we're trying to loosen tight organizations. We can really think about, is this rule really necessary? For example, do we have to really be wearing the same thing? Do we need to be so formal? Like, what is that serving, that purpose? Like, let's think about the rules very mindfully. Allowing exploration, giving people that psychological safety to think outside the box is really important in trying to insert some loosening into a tight organization and becoming more decentralized, encouraging pushback. These are some of the things that we're finding help um, to make that kind of pivot to, to happen more easily. Uh, we call this a cure model. These are kind of like, <laughs> we came up with these acronyms, like having fun, like, all right, how do we organize this acronym? But if, you know, this is really just to say that sometimes Loose cultures need some more structure, and how do you do that? Well, it's kind of the flip side. You need more accountability in these systems, more monitoring, more enforcement. These places need to be a little more centralized. They become too decentralized. Uh, and we need to really um, make sure that people know that they're accountable, that these rules are being enforced. Uh, of course, these things are not easy. I would say two things we've learned about managing resistance is that they come from the cultural codes. Loosening tight organizations is really frightening for some people. Like they're really used to a lot of control and that feels very safe. And so when people, managers come in and say, hey, let's loosen up. I've seen this in a lot of manufacturing contexts. So, hey, we're gonna now become creative and let's loosen. If you think back to that three-year-old, like that's not really you know, how we might have been programmed. This is gonna take a little longer. There's a lot more cultural inertia in tight cultures. They take longer to change. And I think starting with small steps is really important in that pivot. But tightening loose organizations is also, people get really irritated with this also for different reasons. This is a threat to autonomy. Like, what do you mean you're telling me we gotta tighten up? I talked to some people at Microsoft uh, who were doing this in the early days where there was so much autonomy and so much decentralization when it was like causing a lot of chaos. Um, and here we need to kind of make sure we introduce new rules collaboratively and help people understand why they really are needed because there's a lot of pushback in these systems. Okay. I promise, I'm almost done. I, I, have about 40, I, I was on 40 minutes. I, I'm gonna talk for maybe five more minutes. Uh, am I okay? Okay. Um, and you guys probably need some coffee by now, right? You're like, oh my God, this woman's exhausting me. All right, so in any event, um, I'm just gonna get to the final thing of COVID. Uh, and this was really, um, really a strange time, obviously for all of us, just awful. And as a cross-cultural psychologist, I was, really getting nervous around early March, just observing, I was in Breckenridge skiing and just observing, like calling home and finding out all the kind of egocentric behavior that's happening already, like it was looking like a really loose mess. Uh, 
And I read an op-ed that was in the Boston Globe that I just kind of talked about, you know, this is something that's just natural from an evolution point of view. During a collective threat, we need to tighten, it's temporary. Like, it's gonna help us defeat the threat. And then I was also thinking, well, maybe I should not be getting so, um, so worried, because a lot of our research suggests that groups tighten naturally. We did during 9-11, we did during World War II. Um, there's lots of evidence this happens. And in fact, in many of our computational models, it just happens uh, that, that you insert a threat into a, into a group that that coordination happens naturally. But of course, we never really tested, well, is this process gonna take longer in looser cultures? Like, we never actually tested that. And we started to look at the data, and we're like, oh my gosh, like, this is not looking good. <laughs> Um, you know, you look at, this is very early on, cases per million, deaths per million uh, around the world. Of course, this got much, much worse. And, and then I started um, reading in evolutionary biology this very interesting construct called uh, evolutionary mismatches. Uh, and the idea is that traits that evolved in one context could be really, that were adaptive in that context, could be really maladaptive in a new environment that's changed really quickly. And it's really interesting literature, because it um, it's talks about all sorts of human problems like obesity, drug addiction, gambling, all sorts of things that our minds were kind of evolved in a certain context. When you shift the environment, like they're just, they're not evolved, uh, they're maladaptive in a new context. Uh, the greatest story was of the dodo bird. The poor bird was this fearless bird in Mauritius. Who, when humans entered that territory, were just really super friendly and they got wiped out within a generation. Now, I didn't want to argue that like, you know, loose cultures of the dodo birds, but we were, you know, really kind of getting a little bit concerned about the liabilities of looseness during collective threat uh, in general. Um, and we started developing some computational models, and sure enough, we could see that they're taking longer loose cultures to tighten, and that actually what was even more interesting is that tightening helped to reduce the threat. There was a direct kind of connection with that. Uh, and then this data we published in The Lancet, Planetary Health, uh, a couple months ago, and this is just some of the correlations. You could see that pretty serious, you know, significant correlation between tightness and having lower cases per capita. Uh, this is also controlling for like everything you can possibly think of, um, including wealth and inequality and population density and age and government interventions and all sorts of things. And then we looked at the death data, it was even more kind of striking. Um, it's not the only predictor, of course, but it's just culture, culture has some predictive power, even after we control for so many things. Again, I can send you the paper if you're interested, but one of the most interesting findings, and I just wrote an op-ed about this last week, and it's, it's called a failure of fear, <laughs> uh, was that actually in our data, loose cultures were far less scared about COVID. From, from the first 100 cases of when that uh, COVID hit the country till the time period we were analyzing, till the late fall, and it was just so strange because tight cultures were doing much better, but they were still much more fearful. Um, so this is just to say that, you know, I think at the national level, you know, this is clearly a, where we need a case for ambidexterity. And there are examples of this. New Zealand's a great example, the famous Kiwis. You know, they basically were able to pivot with good leadership and also with people willing to follow the rules. I was told in New Zealand, which is very egalitarian, that if some people are following the rules, then everyone's got to follow the rules. And they were really, very much calling out behavior from people that weren't following the rules. The hotlines you know, and the phone calls coming in that reporting people were really incredibly active. <laughs> in our research though, like loose cultures don't like calling people out. It's almost a norm violation to start calling people out for the norm violating behavior. Uh, now with that said, we know that innovations came incredibly and maybe from loose cultures, uh, including finding COVID in sewage and all sorts of incredible you know, inventions to help us with this. So it's, again, you know, can we be balanced? Can we think about how can we uh, encourage people to follow the rules, encourage people un to understand it's temporary, uh, the faster we tighten, the faster we can return to our, our freedom. And I think that we do know that that also requires a collective consciousness of like, we're all in this, in to get in this together. So um, I have this, the last slide is for, this is the tight, the tight loose mindset quiz. Uh, this is the chaos versus order Muppet quiz. It's based on the science data, um, and it will give you kind of a general score, although we know we can each tighten or loosen depending on the context. Uh, and I would love for you to sort of either here today or else, you know, outside of this awesome conference to kind of, you know, come back and if you have stories for me, we'd love to hear your tight loose stories or ideas for collaborations. Always open to that. And I just thank you so much for inviting me.
So I had one question, Michelle. Yes. Uh, the question is about the adaptability part as well. So are the Kiwis more adaptable as a culture? I mean, is it a part of the loose cultures? Um, I think that adaptability is really interesting because I think loose cultures are definitely more adaptive when there's more kind of a new idea or something. It's like easier to get it, you know, to kind of catch on. But during a collective threat, you need to also, um, if it's adaptability in that context, it means giving up some freedom. Mm -hmm. It means giving, sacrificing that freedom yeah. for some constraint, which is very difficult. So in that case, I think loose cultures are less adaptable mm -hmm. during a collective exactly. threat. Uh, but that's not to say that they can't be. I think in that case, as I mentioned, that was a great ambidexterity case yeah. study that yeah. we really need to learn from. And I'll also mention, you know, there's plenty of places that were uh, tight in our data, but that prematurely loosened, mm -hmm. uh, and or that had other problems that made it hard to, you know, continue that tight response. So it also goes both ways. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's culture's destiny. I think the more we know about it, the more we understand it that the better we're able to capitalize on it during the right context. And it's a, in that sense, it's you know, tighten when there's threat and loosen when it's safe, and that makes a lot of sense. I think at the individual level, I think there's a lot of conflicts that happen across tight, loose lines mm -hmm. when it comes to finances and to parenting, to dishwasher loading behavior. I, I can tell you that Todd is deeply disturbed at how I load the dishwasher. <laughs> And I've often thought that should be a litmus test. Like, if you want to figure out, like, you know, you're thinking about, you know, dating someone or you're, just give them a dishwasher to load. <laughs> See, I mean, I, by the way, I haven't validated this, but I, I'm going to bet some money on it. Uh, or towels in the bed, you know. And so, on the one hand, though, you know, there's, you know, like at the national level, organizational level, you can start thinking about, well, wait, what's really great about that person's strategy and what's deficient about mine? Like, it really kind of, helps you to empathize about why would they might have evolved to have a tighter loose mindset. What's about their history, their own levels of threat in their histories, their occupations and so forth, um, or religion or other contexts that have kind of shaped their tight loose propensities and, and maybe how do they offset some of our own liabilities and, and likewise strengths. Mm -hmm. um, but these conflicts, you know, I, now I just see them everywhere, you know, even on vacation with my siblings. You, know, you sort of see the tensions along the lines of spontaneity structure and, and so forth. Um, but I think, as I mentioned, I think they're negotiable, and that's what's exciting about it. Um, so stay tuned on, sure. on that stuff. And Thank I'll, you. Yeah. Where do you think the idea around common good Common good, a like collective good. Yeah, like doing not what you want to do, but what is right for everybody around you. Yeah, well, I think that, you know, the, the reason why it might be easier for people in tight cultures to coordinate is that they've learned the hard way across history that, like, when you don't have the collective good in mind, you can't solve that problem. Like, it's just impossible. You can't individually deal with, you know, a natural disaster. So the common good prime is kind of higher in a, in a tighter context. Um, it doesn't mean it can't be you know, activated uh, in other contexts, but I think it's, there's a reason why it might be more natural in some contexts than others. I think one of the things that, you know, I, when I went to Champaign-Urbana to work with Triandis, Harry Triandis, um, I really I, I admired his approach, which was that culture, it's not just descriptive. There might be, like, we have to understand it's ecological and historical foundations. It doesn't mean they're all rational cultural differences, but I thought that was mind-blowing. <laughs> you know, I, I thought it was just incredibly interesting that you know, we can describe lots of things about people, but what if we start thinking about the why? Like, once you think about why, then you can have more empathy for differences. I think that's where I found that training, even though I had to you know, deal with Champaign-Urbana for five years. I'm in a New Yorker. I'm not sure if you guys have ever been to Champaign-Urbana. Sorry to my Champagne Urbana friends out there, but got to adapt quickly to that cornfield context. Uh, other questions? Yep. So you, you asked us our preference between Titan and Lewis, and you started this. Do you have a, a preference or a bias to one or the other? Uh, this is a really good question. Um, <laughs> and I've been thinking about that question a lot, because I definitely, I, I'm moderately loose on my own scale. There's no question. Um, but there's certain domains that really, I think, are important. And again, and I'm just going to, again, this is just like too much information, TMI. But in the, in the household, we have two daughters. And it's like, well, which domains to me are really tight? And there are some, like how they treat each other, how hard they work, 
Those are tight domains. But then there's so much looseness. Like what they wear, like with their bedtime, their, how messy they are. I mean, Todd is just horrified by the household, you know. Um, we've been married 27 years, so it seems to rock solid. But, you know, those are domains. I'm like, we don't need to have a lot of rules about that. Um, so I feel like, you know, I have, a, like many of us who are moderately loose, there's some, like, sort of cardinal areas we try to have some tightness. Because, again, we, if we get too extreme, then it's a problem. So even people who are, have tight mindsets have some context where they're loose. Even at the national level, like Japan's a great example. There's some kind of legislative looseness <laughs> in, you know, your encounters with your boss drinking. <laughs> or in certain areas in Tokyo, there's legislative looseness. Even karaoke is kind of legislative looseness. <laughs> it's got a structure of how do you do loose. Um, even the Kiwis, you know, really loose culture, but the tightness there was so interesting is it's on egalitarianism. It's like, you've probably heard this tall poppy syndrome, like if you try to stand out New Zealand, like you'll get shut down, like this is the strong norm. And that keeps the common good, it keeps people having looseness, but some context where they have a lot of tightness. Um, in the US, I think our tightness is around individual rights and freedom. You know, I think every culture is their tightness is around really important values. Uh, and maybe that is really, it's a profound, amazing thing that we've organized this nation on that basis. And it also can get us into trouble as well. So it's, you know, this is where just thinking about it, we can start redesigning and uh, recalibrating as needed. That was way too much information on my family life. So I don't, just, yeah. Understanding thought studies around what you're predisposed to, the left brain, right brain, more inclined to be tight versus loose versus what behavioral influences and this conflict and how that comes into play and where you kind of follow. This. Yeah, it's such an interesting question. And we don't have a lot of data on genetics and tight loose. I've, we have one paper on it, but it was looking at, you know, kind of essentially some genetic differences in, across nations that are linked to a short allele that has to do with vigilance and uh, anxiety, which were higher in tighter cultures. But, you know, I, I am a firm believer that we might have a default, we may set on a default for whatever reasons, but we can actually also pivot within some range of variation um, with, you know, with time. And I think it's difficult because it's also a self-selection issue. In some recent studies, we looked at what kind of people are attracted to tight or loose organizations. And so we can have the same stimuli presenting like a really tight organization versus a loose organization, and we can give them the tight, loose mindset scale. And we see very clearly this like self-selection. Uh, loose individuals' mindsets tend to like the structure, uh, tend to like the looseness of those organizations and vice versa. And, and people I've interviewed, uh, for example, in startup context, you know, they tell me they have like serial startup problems, because they have a loose mindset, they might be bought out by a great company, but it's bigger and tighter, and then they're like, ugh, like, we don't like each other anymore. <laughs> um, and so, you know, I think part of it is that those things get reinforced based on the, the you know, the situations that we are navigated to. Um, ben Schneider, my colleague who hired me at Maryland, would say the people make the place, you know, kind of that natural sort of selection and attraction into organizations that, in, in, you know, eventually becomes more homogeneous. But, you know, now we're trying to do studies where we bring people together to try to see how can we get that tight loose ambidexterity in teams? Like how can we help people understand they need both mindsets in the same project, in the same situation? And there's a lot of ways that we might be able to accomplish that. But, you know, this is, that's why you have to invite me back later on, you know, after I have, like, Here's the top five ways way to do that. We have hunches around this, but now we're trying to study it more systematically. Um, and we're also developing more organizational level measures of tight loose that are domain specific. Like how tight or loose is this group in terms of the language that people have to use or the way they dress, where they work, how they work. We're doing this for the US Navy because what we wanna have is like a profile of like, here's your profile in this unit of where the norm strength is. And now we can choose, like do we really need this here or maybe we need to strengthen there, maybe it's, it, that will help us to drill down into more kind of specifics. Um, so uh, there was another, yeah. <laughs> I think we'll keep this for the last question. Thank <laughs> 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 you. It is a good balance. This meeting, actually, when they were talking in the beginning speech, I'm like, there's ambidexterity here. You know, uh, there's like, we have a learning orientation that's kind of loose, but there's some structure. 
What did your research find uh, in terms of correlation for happiness between tight and loose cultures at the country level? Country level? Yeah, it's robustly curvilinear. So, you know, there's some, and I should also mention that this, dis this distinction of tight loose is different than individualism and collectivism. That's something I worked on a lot with Harry. Because you can have, and, and I should say that because individuals and cultures tend to be happier. That's what the data show. A lot of it's driven by wealth because they tend to be richer. But tightness is not correlated with wealth at the national level. So that's where we see that you know, it's really more the extremes of extreme tight, extreme loose that have problems. You know, in, in the book, we talk a lot about dynamics between those two um, and how we can kind of predict when extreme looseness is going to invite the opposite attractor of tightness. Um, so I do work also on psychology of terrorism and on like dynamics of um, autocracy in the Middle East. We call it autocratic recidivism. And a lot of it has to do with, you know, that we kind of take our American sort of um, frames of mind into a region where when you take out an autocratic leader, it's going to create a lot of extreme looseness. Um, and that's what we saw with a lot of our data. And that invites, you know, it, it requires tightening. Uh, and I could talk more about this offline, but we also find in contexts where there's been, you know, kind of cultural anime, like normlessness, that's where we, we see that ISIS has an easier time taking over in our data. So there's a lot to be said about more on these extremes than I've been getting into. Um, so, yeah, um, short answer is it's curvilinear, but there's a lot more interesting stuff going on with the extremes and how we can be on our lookout for them uh, in terms of what psychologically they, they attract uh, and the repeated patterns that we see. Woo, okay guys, thank you. <laughs>